This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Appendix, A Genealogy of Force, A Fable In the beginning, harmony. Communities of human beings live as one, gathering and eating and playing and sleeping and singing and making love and telling stories together, and occasionally discord, an argument breaks out, strong words are exchanged, a blow is struck. When this happens, the community meets and arrives at a resolution. Communities that cannot do this break up, and the members starve or freeze or are hunted down by wild beasts or join another community that can resolve conflicts. Conflicts between communities are resolved in a similar manner. For thousands upon thousands of years, this way of life works and endures. But one day, some cultural or technological innovation enables one group to accumulate power in such a way that they do not have to concern themselves with resolving conflicts. They can offload the negative consequences on others. Now discussion, placation, even combat do not serve to conclude hostilities. The combatants do not find their way back to peace as the others did before, but seek only to obtain more power. Intent on controlling and dominating others, even at the cost of their own happiness or safety, they become machines of war. Their relationship with the environment shifts. The earth must be disciplined now to provide them resources of food to last through their struggle. Their relationships with each other change. They evaluate others as potential comrades in arms or enemies, appraising might above all of their qualities. The neighboring communities do not escape unscathed. Soon they are embroiled in this struggle as well, and must contend with an enemy such as they have never encountered. Many of these communities perish outright. Others, determined to survive at any cost, find that they too must become war machines. They too subjugate the earth and its animals, enslave their vanquished foes, even their own people, anything to endure the face of this terror. They become the terror, they outdo it, and this is their undoing. Spreading like a cancer, from community to community, strange changes sweep the face of the earth. Little communities merge to become big communities, and ultimately nations. Temporary military leaders become hereditary monarchs. The vision of once peace-loving peoples becomes clouded with carnage. And it is not only in military matters that these communities change. Territory is claimed and marked, and becomes the source of new conflicts. Patriarchy appears the undeclared war between the sexes, the gendered roles of warrior and servant, institutionalized and enforced by each generation on the next. Market economics arises. People who no longer trust each other insist on trade where gifts once sufficed, and scramble to outwit each other, to profit at others' expense even in peacetime. Organized religion is invented. Now men do not vie for land, food, property, and power, but also to govern each other's minds and hearts. All of these innovations are catastrophic for human beings. They try to offset the effects with new innovations, and the new innovations prove to be greater catastrophes. Governments, convened to protect peoples, extract taxes from them, and thrive idly off their sweat and toil. Police fill the streets to prevent crime, and perpetrate worse crimes with impunity. Defending themselves from the monstrosities of civilization, these people breed more awful monsters. Minor nations, hell-bent on withstanding the assault of greater ones, arm themselves to the teeth, and go on fighting and conquering an exaggerated response to the original threat until they become great empires. So the Roman Empire finds its origins in the resistance of rural farmers to Etruscan encroachments. So the rest of Europe becomes a snake pit of competing empires as a consequence of hundreds of years spent fighting Rome. Later historians will look at the bloody wars waged on the edges of every civilization as evidence that the, quote, heart of darkness beyond this frontier is a bloody barbarism. But perhaps it is the peace-loving barbarians who are defending themselves from the bloodthirsty. The true heart of darkness lies at the center of these empires, in the eye of the hurricane, where violence is so deeply ingrained in human life that it is no longer visible to the naked eye. Slaves go about in the street as if of their own volition, powerless even to rebel. Gladiators slaughter each other in the circuses, and it is called entertainment. The next military campaigns are a symptom of social viciousness, not a cause. 
Now the invisible violence of economics ordains the visible violence of armies. Soldiers cut paths into the last wilderlands of barbarism, so further resources can be seized by merchants, and the freshly destitute barbarians become a new consumer base. Whole continents are despoiled and the inhabitants enslaved, and then the looters cite their destitution as proof of their racial inferiority. Missionaries are in the front lines of the assault, enforcing the reign of the jealous one and only God as surely as the soldiers enforce the reign of brutality. Terror for territory, blood for money, money for blood, he ordains it all as it ordains him. The successors of the missionaries pray directly to the market. These new priests are even more successful than the soldiers in imposing the rule of power. A day comes when shackles are no longer needed to keep the population servile, when idolatry alone is enough to keep people fighting amongst themselves. Now no one can remember any other life, and son fights brother, fights father, fights neighbor, as the specters of fear and avarice look over the empire from above kings generals presidents rise and fall but the system hierarchy remains competition itself holds the crown picking and discarding its champions without pity everyone in these relationships of violence still wants desperately to escape but again and again they bear the seeds of this violence with them destroying every refuge as they enter as the refugees who flee to the new world do and the communists who overthrow the czar even those who do escape, like the artists whose communes gentrify neighborhoods, whose provocative innovations set precedents for the next generation's fashion photography, only pave the way for the steamrollers that follow in their footsteps. Violence reaches an all-time high. Schoolchildren, mailmen, formerly the very picture of sociability, begin to gun down their companions in cold blood. Ministers molest altar boys, fathers battle their daughters, teenagers rape their dates, prisons overflow, millions perish in holocausts, and the maimed survivors initiate subsequent holocausts. Nuclear missiles point at everyone until the imminence of the final holocaust can only be discussed in platitudes. Now we are all on death row, all political prisoners. Even in the loftiest citadels of the United States, protected by the most sophisticated and well-equipped military in the history of the solar system, white-collar workers with full benefits and health insurance are no longer safe. Airplanes crash, skyscrapers fall, terror threatens us all. Tonight a Palestinian youth struggles to work out the equation. Have his enemies filled his world with enough misery that he feels more hatred for them than he does love for life? He thinks of his crippled father, of his bulldozed house, of his departed friends, who computed the same equation daily, always coming to one conclusion, until the day they came to another. Where through all this is love? It is still here, in the forms it has always taken, families eating together, friends embracing, gifts given simply for the pleasure of giving. We still forgive, converse, fall deeply in love. It even happens occasionally that new communities federate to confront a common antagonist, not out of malice, but for the sake of peace, hoping to resolve conflicts as they were resolved in the days before warfare and commerce. These moments, even when they occur between only a few individuals, are as powerful and precious as they ever were. And they are still infectious, as infectious as violence and hatred, if only they can find unarmored hearts in which to catch hold. The world now waits for a war on war, a love armed, a friendship which can defend itself. Anarchy is a word we use to describe those moments when force cannot subdue us, and life flourishes as we know it should. Anarchism is the science of creating and defending such moments. It is a weapon that aspires to uselessness, the only kind of weapon we will wield hoping against hope that this time, through some new alchemy, our weapons will not turn on us. We know that after the revolution, after every revolution, the struggle between love and hatred, between coercion and cooperation, will continue. But then, as now, as always, the important question is, which side are you on? This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.